guys. Welcome back to another edition of Chats in the Blog Cabin. Now, you may remember Chad. Chad has been on before, and he came on to talk about education system, and now he's going to come back on to talk about how parents can engage their kids during this summer so they don't lose that learning or what they thought they learned this year, this school year. <laughs> this school year, we just got on talking about, right before we got on, we talked about what a trial this school year has been. So Chad, before we get into talking about what we're going to talk about, introduce yourself, tell people how why you're qualified to talk about what we're talking about today. Yeah, so I've spent my career in education, uh, most of the career, 20 years in Nebraska. Started out as a vocal music teacher, and then I was a professional developer where I worked with teachers and principals from 30 some school districts. Uh, then I was a high school principal, a grade seven through 12 principal and a central office administrator um, in South Central Nebraska, mid-sized district. Um, director of CIA was the title of the, of the position. In education, CIA has a different meaning than, than the rest of the world. It means curriculum, instruction and assessment. Um, so overseeing all of the CIA processes for the school district. And then I uh, came to Iowa a few years ago and worked in Ames Community School District as the director of elementary education. And uh, then I went out on my own as a consultant. And so now I've written a couple of books and work with schools and districts around the country and world, uh, leading accreditation visits, um, part of the quality assurance process for Cognia for their accreditation work, uh, and recently uh, became an associate for Solution Tree, which is uh, the premier um, professional learning community organization in the world where they really help schools uh, increase educator effectiveness so that we can improve learning for kids. So let's talk about, there's always that summer slump, I guess what you would call it, where kids, when they get out of school, they forget everything they've learned at school. And then when they start <laughs> back at the school year, they're like, what? We learned that last year, really? Because it's almost like the first almost month of school. It's like review. Basically. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. how can we keep kids engaged in learning and not lose all that they've learned this year? Yeah. Well, I, before that, I should mention I am the father of two amazing boys who are university students now. So uh, I, I don't know if that qualifies me more to speak about uh, this or if my years in education, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I've got some real world lived experiences, you know, of, mm -hmm. of raising a couple of boys. Um, so, yeah, so some people call that the summer slide, you know, that uh, kids are out of school for 10 or 12 weeks during the course of the summer. And so what can we do to help minimize that slide? Um, so there's a, a number of things that come to my mind, and I'm sure we'll talk about a number of things over a course of our time here. But the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, to not to fret, not to worry about um, slides that may happen and really focus in on making sure that your child has really good high quality experiences during the course of the summer. Um, the brain has lots of little, I think of them like little hooks. There's scientific terms for this, right? Dendrites and neurons and all the different stuff. But, but basically there's these like these hooks. And when your brain has experiences, when we have experiences, the brain creates more hooks. And the more hooks there are, the more that new learning can hook onto those hooks. And so, students who have children who have lots of experiences have more hooks to then have the learning in school hook onto. So for example, there's, uh, you know, pretty good research out there that, you know, kids who go to museums and they go to zoos and they go on these types of field trips and excursions, they do better because they've got experiences with these things. So when I'm in third grade and I read a story about I don't know, Babe Ruth or something like that. If I've been to a museum that showcases Babe Ruth, mm. then I am, you know, I, I have those experiences. So taking your kids to these places, um, like I said, museums, zoos, the public library, um, you know, there's lots of local type things that um, kids can participate in that will help create those books. To, to give them better chances than in the course of the year to, to hook that learning onto. Well, I will say the public library, I'm a huge advocate of that. Oh, yeah. When my girls were little, we did the story time at the public library where they always did a craft and they did a little song and they made so many, plus you get the social interaction that you don't normally get right now because I know some schools are still virtual, some schools yeah. are in person, all over the country, it's all different. 
but you get they get that interaction and then they make friends they learn a story you can actually go and spend some time just letting them check out books as well yeah yeah i i, I lots of times in trainings that i do with folks uh use the phrase that learning is socially constructed and individually integrated mm -hmm. so because we are social beings and so mm -hmm. in order to construct that learning we do it in a social context so like you said you know when i go to the library and i engage with my peers that's a social context mm -hmm. and then of course it has to be individually integrated i have to take that and you know think about it through my own lens and my own perspective but but both are absolutely critical um, socially constructed individually integrated and I, one of the things I did when my girls were younger, I think they were like maybe 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and up into their teen years, was we had like a Thursday night movie night. Your dad always worked on Thursday night. So what uh -huh. we did was we constructed a craft around a movie night. We, If it was a book that we were reading, it was we created, um, we read the book first, and then we watched the movie like, um, I know How to Eat Fried Worms was a real big hit with my girls. They <laughs> loved that movie and they loved the book as well because of when Dixie was another one that we would do and we would just kind of create a craft. And that brought, of course, I'm a, I got the teacher background, so that brought the teacher and me out. So I was still actively engaged in creating lesson plans. So by the beginning of the year, I wasn't like <laughs> back at it again. But right, right. Things like that, because a lot of parents, they don't have that time. They have to turn to yeah. movies and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And even, uh, you know, as you were talking there, it made me think about just the importance of talking to your your mm -hmm. children, you know, having conversations so that when you sit down and have a meal together in the evening um, or breakfast together in the morning before you head out, carving out that time as a family to then have a conversation. You know, what's on the docket for today? What were some of the highlights? that you had as you engaged in your, you know, whatever you did today and having conversation. Um, not only does it, you know, fire the neurons in the brain to, to remember what we're doing, but it also builds connections with each other. Um, and then it also um, creates more of those neural pathways, another yeah. scientific term, to be able to um, make those hooks later on. Mm -hmm. um, when we experience something the brain, you know, experiences it. When we have to talk about it to somebody else, the brain re-experiences it and then is better able to recall that experience down the road. And so simple conversations can go a long, long way in um, helping students learn. And going back to simple conversations, like when you're making dinner as well, you know, yeah, have, yeah. Them, have them in there making dinner with you. Absolutely. Not only are they learning a life skill, <laughs> They're still engaged in learning, but you're making it fun for them. I think that's a lot of things. A lot of parents think that learning can't be fun. They have to be like the book learning, but it can be, they can be just as fun and make it fun for the kids. So they're still engaged. Absolutely. I remember when, uh, when my wife and I, when our, our oldest was, I don't know, I think it was like six months old, maybe nine months old. He wasn't very big at all. And I came home from work one day and she was doing dishes with him on her back, you know, They've got pretty fancy mm -hmm. backpack things yeah. these days, but he was in, you know, one back there and she was doing the dishes and she was just talking like, and these are the bubbles and I'm going to turn on some hot water because the water is starting to get cold now. So that'll warm it up a little bit. And, oh, look, there's more bubbles coming. Ah, uh, look, I've got a fork down here. I need, I mean, she just was like narrating <laughs> the whole experience. And I walked in and, and I kind of looked around looking for like, is somebody around here? And, and I said, who are you talking to? She said, well, I'm talking to DL. You know, he's right here and he needs to hear these words. And the, the reality is she was absolutely right. Um, there's some really good research that when children are talked to from the earliest of ages, it develops the brain. It helps them learn later on. And so talk, 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 talk to those kiddos, even when they, before they can even understand the words, it's even more important actually to talk to even more about um, what's going on. Yeah, I think especially when it's your first kid, you talk to them all the time. When the <laughs> second and third ones come around, you don't talk to them as much. So they don't have that vocabulary. Because we always say that my oldest daughter is the old soul because, I mean, literally she was doing everything way ahead of the benchmarks because she was the only one I could talk to because my husband was <laughs> right. at work. So I was talking to her all the time. So that does make a difference because when the second and third came around, you know, first time parent, you're like all over everything. Second, yeah, third, you're yeah. like, oh yeah, oh, we're like yeah. a picture of them, you know? Yeah. 
that's maybe where the older ones pick up some of the slack for, for us as parents and maybe do some of the talking for us, maybe. <laughs> now, you mentioned field trips. Now, a lot of parents aren't yeah. able to do a lot of field trips because money is an issue, because the economy still is in a slump because of COVID mm -hmm. and a lot of people being laid off. So what are some alternatives for that? Oh, man, I had so much fun doing some research uh, for this, thinking about, you know, opportunities for parents. Um, and you and I talked about it before the show that, you know, maybe because of COVID, there's a lot more uh, opportunities available. Um, people don't, I, it doesn't even occur to me anyway, but, but there are a lot of places where you can go. Like the Smithsonian has all kinds of things on display that you can go online and see. Um, the Louvre in Paris has um, um, what's it called field trips virtual field trips mm -hmm. and yeah you'll put up some of these different uh, links here there's some some links that I found that had you know 10 field trips here 25 field trips here 40 field trips here there are a ton of different options out there that are just amazing um, you can take your you know just from the, the living room of your home uh, you can go to um, Yellowstone National Park and see some of the wildlife and sites there. And yeah, there's the Discovery Education one that you put up there just now. Discovery Education has amazing things. Um, there's a We Are Teachers link that you'll probably put up here in a minute. Yeah, there it is. Uh, we Are Teachers. I think that one's got like 25 different wow. links that, that could potentially be helpful. And again, I think it goes back to our earlier conversation that it's, it's not just a matter of putting your child on the device and letting them go, mm -hmm. um, although that can work, and then you come back and talk about it later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're at work and the child's at home, here's some few, you know, there's probably enough links in these links that I've shared with you that you could have a, a field trip every day over the course of the summer and never repeat something where your child could virtually be going to Machu Picchu and the Louvre and the Smithsonian and uh, Metropo Metropolitan Museum of the Art. Um, there's some musical ones where you can go and um, participate in a concert at Carnegie Hall. Just some really amazing, um, and, and they're all free. Everything that I provided for you, are everything is free. So um, go visit, do it yourself. Um, do it with your kids, assign it to them during the course of the day, um, and, but then talk about it. Talk about the experience with each other. I love how you said assign it to them. We <laughs> need to do a different way of phrasing that because if you say assign it, they're not going to do it because they're yeah, not, I'm yeah. not learning. It's summer. So maybe it's like, yeah. you know what? Today, let's tr take a trip down the Louvre. Let's look at yeah. the Mona Lisa. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. Maybe it's a challenge instead, you know, today's today's challenge is, you know, you could set it up that way, too. You know, here's here's the links over the course of the summer. Which which one are you going to go to today? What's your challenge today? Uh, maybe you could set it up as a as a game. Try try to find three things that when you ask me about it, that I don't know anything about it, uh, you know. Um, yeah, like, you know, just fun little things. And then, you know, it can be a competition in the family. Who can stump mom? Who can stump dad? Uh, who can stump grandma and grandpa? You know, um, you know, maybe you call up a uncle or a brother or sister who lives someplace else and, and share with them interesting tidbits about what you learned. But these experiences are really important for kids to have. I love that because, you know, at any age until the kids are grown, they think parents are quote unquote stupid and they know nothing, you know how that goes. So <laughs> yeah, the fact yeah, that yeah. they're making it into a game that they're challenge you're challenging them to stump you is something that I think every kid's gonna get on board on because they're gonna go, hmm, I'm gonna, I'm bound to determine to stump them. <laughs> <laughs> you, there may actually, I didn't do any looking for this, but I wonder if there, if, if uh, folks could like Google like some bingo games during the course of the summer, you know, parent child bingo games. I bet somebody has created some kind of things along those lines where, you know, different activities that, that you can play with each other to try to, you know, win with comp friendly competitions, you know. I love that. Speaking of bingo, what about if they're on a road trip somewhere, like if they actually mm. are able to leave the state? A car mm -hmm. bingo is really good. Like how many license plates or how, what if you see a cow, you know, make up, they, parents can make up cards so they can buy cards online and just yep. find things they can work out. Pinterest is a great source for that. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, it also, one of the games we played with uh, our kids a lot was, uh, and I don't know if we made it up or if we modified it or if we uh, stole it from someone, What? but it was, I'm thinking of an animal that begins with the letter. And um, so then that person then, you know, has the animal and then the rest ask questions to find out what that animal is, you know, um, and typically for us, the first question, does it walk, swim or fly? Does it have skin, scales, or feathers? Um, again, getting back to this idea of having conversations and building vocabulary so that we're talking about the types of things that, um, that animals have. You can do the same thing with other things. I'm thinking of a famous destination um, that begins with a letter, whatever. Um, the, the importance of conversations and um, making those connections to other areas. I know when my daughter, my youngest one is 19 now, but just last year she, when we were going to visit her sister which is two and a half hours away she would say i'm looking at billboards and i'm trying to find a word in every billboard and all the billboards that we passed that begin with the going through the alphabet a b c d e f g and she went through and i had to do a detour because i knew where one of the really hard ones were so i was like okay well detour so you can grab it but but that got her engaged on looking what's going on around yeah her. Yeah, and talking about it, and 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 in that case, you know, with particular with young kid, young kids, then they're looking at their letters, mm -hmm. um, you know, and recognizing letters, letter shapes, capital letters, lowercase letters, numbers, um, you know, because we know, particularly with with young kids, you know, four, five, six, even up to seven, that that autom we, we've got to get the automaticity going, mm -hmm. so that when you see the letter Q, you know that that's the letter Q, and you don't even have to think about it. Um, and, and same with the words, you know, you can do that with sight words too, um, particularly for those young kids, you know, we're looking for all of any of your sight words that you learned this year in kindergarten. So, you know, kindergarten, typically they're the, the, I, a, an, and, uh, we, it, she, he, you know, these are those sight words in kindergarten. And, you know, um, you can, you can get that list pretty easily from mm -hmm. your teachers at school. If you're a preschool parent and your kid is going to be in kindergarten next year, go to the school and talk to the principal or kindergarten teacher and say, hey, can I have the list of sight words that you're going to be expecting next year, um, kids to learn, so we can be working that on that this summer? If your kid's in kindergarten going into first grade, go to the first grade teacher and say, hey, can we get that list of sight words? Sometimes they're called high-frequency words, so it kind of depends on what language the school uses, but get that list and start working on it uh, in advance. And then, you know, re you mentioned early on, you know, kids forget over the summer, review it over the summer as well. But mm -hmm. um, the importance of those high frequency words, I forget the exact statistic, but it's, it's uh, my, my mind is telling me it's somewhere between like 40 and 60% of all the words that we read are those high frequency words. So if we can get children to be able to just look at the word the and know it's the, mm -hmm. we are a long way away, you know, a long way down the path of being able to read with those 200, 250 high frequency words that show up in the vast majority of our, um, our literature. Yeah. So let's talk about reading. Um, yeah. I've always found that it wasn't important that they were reading the classics or anything like that, just as long as they were engaged in something they were reading. Like if you have a young, a young boy that wants to read comic books, let them read comic books because it's yes. something that they enjoy reading. Yep. 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 Um, we know that the more a person reads, the better they become at reading. <laughs> so the more time that kids spend reading, the better they will do down the road. Um, and even immediately. And so, yeah, especially those what third, fourth, and, and fifth grade boys, especially where there's the, uh, they don't call them comic books anymore. What do they call them? Visual, they've got a different name for them now. Um, I don't remember what it is. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> let them read it. Let them read it. Uh, or, and even into middle school, let them read. The more they read, the better readers they will become. And, um, and, and that's that. And then the better learners they become, because up until somewhere around second or third grade, graphic novel, that's what it's called. Yeah. Graphic novel. I knew it was going to come to me. Um, so graphic novels, let the kids read them. Um, up until somewhere around third grade, kids are learning to read. And then like this shift happens where kids then read to learn. 
-hmm. And so we just need to make sure that kids have that opportunity to know how to read so that they can then read to learn, get them reading, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Even if it's the back <laughs> of the cereal box when they're eating cereal. Or the back, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, backs of cereal boxes are amazing. You know, I, I never could pronounce riboflavin, but I sure read it a whole heck of a lot when I was in <laughs> acetic acid. <laughs> so we talked about reading, we talked about field trips, and which is art. Let's talk about some of the other ones that, you know, math and science and, you know, music, uh, mm -hmm. the creative arts as well, because that's important to engage them in. Yeah. The more experiences, the better. Um, so um, let's talk about music because that was, you know, Yours. my uh, my my specialty was music, right? Um, someone pointed out that uh, from the moment we're born, music is part of our lives, and actually before the time we're born, um, because the first sounds that we hear inside our mother's womb is the beat of the heart and the rhythm of the heart. And so we hear this rhythm and it's part of who we are. Music is, is just who we are. And then we come out and first thing, we, we make a really loud operatic, some people call it a cry, other people call it singing. Huh. <laughs> That's interesting. So, and, and what do we do when we talk to, to babies, right? Oh, look at you, how are you doing? Oh, how cute, right? And we use a sing-songy voice because it, connects and, and helps us connect with the child and the child responds to it. So music is like a natural part of who we are. So so sing, put on music on the radio. It doesn't matter if it's it's bad or you know if you don't sing well or not, sing with your child. Um, kids do uh, are naturally attracted to music. Somewhere along the line, I think many of us like somehow we get diverted off of a path of, of songs and music, but um, you know, you, you go to a sporting event and when I when you think of a sporting event, many times you think of the fight song of that school, right? Um, and, and the chants that go along with that. Um, when you go to a, a faith-based organization, whether it's a Jewish or Christian or Muslim or Baha'i or whatever faith-based organization you're part of, music is a key part of that, whether it's chanting or uh, playing or hymns, there's music is a, a key part of that. So um, just embrace that and use that um, as part of your learning. And you can also use music to help with like the sight words because you can mm. find songs mm -hmm. that have the sight words in them. Um, multiplication tables, especially if you're going into that third grade, because third grade is where they hit hard in North Carolina with the multiplication tables. So go ahead and uh -huh. have your kids yeah. already yeah. primed yeah. to learn those tables because if you're they're not great at memorizing things, it's going to be hard for them. Yes, yeah, yeah. Music do, it does wonders with that. And and if you're if you're really uncomfortable with singing, okay, do some instrument things. Uh, I remember um, one day I, again, I came home from work, and um, DL. Our oldest son was probably, I don't know, maybe 14, 15 months. He was little again. I don't remember these ages anymore, but he was little. <laughs> and he had he had crawled into the cabinet with all of the pots and pans and pulled them all out. And he was sitting there with a wood wooden stick in his hands, and he was just making music on the tops of these pots and pans. Wonderful. That's great. You know, uh, there's these, these uh, Tupperware containers empty cardboard boxes. You can make sounds out of just about anything. Get them out and use it. Um, when our kids were a little bit older, we would do things at the table, uh, at dinner table again. Um, you know, if the conversation started to get in a lull, one person might start, take their fork and start tapping it on the edge of the table gently, right? And then somebody else would then take their spoon and tap it on the side of their glass. And then somebody else would, you know, make some other kind of sound. And as a family, we're just having fun. We're creating, we're making music together just based on what we have. We don't need to go buy a piano or we don't need to get voice lessons. We can make music just with what we have. So that brings me to the next thing, because you talked about tapping the fork and everything is movement, because that's very important with yeah. kids now too, because mm -hmm. obesity in, ch in children are, is the numbers are sky high. So let's yeah. talk about how we can do learning and movement at the same time. 
Yeah, movement's really critical. Um, <laughs> so we know that the brain in order to learn requires blood. And when we're sitting, the blood pools in our feet and in our buttocks. And so that's not conducive to, mm -hmm. to learning. And so we, we need to get the heart moving that blood up into the brain. And so uh, I'm an advocate of physical education, not just as a class, but we have to have movement in classrooms and at homes as well, that, that um, getting up, getting movement, getting the blood flow moving. And it doesn't have to be huge things, uh, you know, standing up and walking around the house. Um, I remember again, relying on my experiences as a parent, when we got a van for the first time around, I don't know, 2009 or 10. So the boys would have been like nine and 11 or something like that. And it had a built-in TV in the back. Like they all come with that now. These, mm -hmm. This was like one of the new fancy ones. Uh -huh. Actually, yeah. we might've had to pay extra to get it. And we would only allow them to watch a movie the last 30 minutes of any trip that we were on. And um, so they had to do other things. You know, we play the um, thinking of an animal game or they would read books or other, you know, types of activities. And then the last 30 minutes we put on a movie. And we always knew when the movie was over without fail, the movie ended and they started bickering with each other. <laughs> and, and I think it's because, I don't have any scientific evidence behind this, but I think it's because, you know, that blood had been pooling. They hadn't been actively engaging with us or each other. And the mind now was no longer being, you know, numbed by the movie. And now they were bickering and fighting with each other. So we had to, we had, we got really good at being able to time it out to make sure <laughs> that, that we were at our destination <laughs> when that, that movie stopped because, you know, that, that physical movement is, is absolutely incredible. Um, the other thing that I would also mention was interesting is that audiobooks did mm -hmm. not have that same effect. And so just put that out there for folks. Uh, if anybody's wanting to do a research study on this, I thought it was interesting that when they listened to audiobooks, when those ended, it did not have that effect of them bickering with each other. It had the effect of them wanting to talk with each other and with us about what happened with the, uh, with the audiobook. And there's some great... Uh, you know, I had boys, so the audiobooks we listened to were a lot of Hank the How, Hank, Hank the Cow Dog, I think is what his name is. Um, so you know, go to your public library. If you've got boys, pick up Hank the How Dog. If you've got girls, pick up Hank the How Dog. It's a great uh, set of uh, books. And there may be other ones that you know your daughter might like better, but um, our boys really like Hank the Cow Dog. I know Amelia Bedelia was the big one with us. Ah, like, yes. the girls mm -hmm. loved reading Amelia Bedelia. And I'd have to explain the little um, metaphors that she uses and the little words of the differences that she's using for words. I had to explain, this is why it's so funny to me. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then they realize it, you know, because she's, she's really off the wall. But you brought up the audiobooks. A lot of Kindles now have it mm. the option where you can have the book read out loud to you on the Kindle. Yes. Yeah. And that's a really awesome feature, especially if you're traveling, like you mentioned, because uh, like our boys, they would get car sick when they read in the car. And so the audiobook is a really wonderful option. And, um, you know, list, there's pretty good research around listening to, to stories being read also helps to develop the brain and reduce gaps in um, the reduce the learning loss over the summer and in increase student performance. Now, what about things that we can do like in person? Like it, let's say there's a concert in the park. Would you mm -hmm. suggest like bringing a picnic, having the whole family out, doing a whole family day, and then maybe you have some kind of activity that involves around with the concert? Because I know yeah. a lot of times when you're listening to live music, you can't be still when you're listening to live music. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It kind of depends on where the concert is. You know, um, a lot of times in the summer, you know, there's com community municipal bands that are out in a park where you can definitely get up and stand and dance around as the music is going or or ha you know talk to your child about oh do you hear that that's a tuba or you know and and talk about the different types of instruments and you know bring up bring your phone and and um, bring up images so your child can look at the the instruments up close and afterwards go up and have the your child look at and talk to the musicians and what it's like um, but again all of this these activities 
helps to, to slow learning loss and accelerate learning gains because again, we're building background knowledge and creating more hooks. So when we talk to our child about harmony and melody as part of music, then when they read stories and they read about harmony, then they can remember back to, oh yeah, harmony is when something sounds good in music. Maybe that is also something that sounds good or feels good when I'm with people and they can make these context clue connections to it. And so the conversations, the vocabulary, the language, can't, can't uh, emphasize that enough, the importance of having those conversations with your child. Now let's talk about rainy day stuff because the field trips are great, but if you're using that when you're gone and when you're at work and they're with the babysitter or something and you're using that as a field trip, they're not going to want to do that on rainy days when they're with you. So let's right. talk about some of the things that you can do on a rainy day. I know for one, we used to turn on the radio and just have dance parties and just move and dancing and everything. And then we would snuggle down and read a book. But what are some of the other things that you could do? Oh man, uh, you know, I'm not a very creative person. So that's kind of hard for me to <laughs> come up with those. My, my mind goes to, let's go to some of these uh, virtual field trips and do those online together, um, you know, and then talk about it and uh, maybe act some of them out. Uh, you know, if you're going to the Smith or the uh, Yellowstone National Park, maybe then you have an activity where you build some, you know, mountains or, you know, experiment with what, what, temperatures of water or things like that to, to help make those connections with your child. Um, I should do some Googling of that to see what I can come up with. I, I bet somebody's got some pretty good rainy idea, rainy day stay at home activities out there. And the fact that you just said you weren't a very creative person, but you're in music, you were a music <laughs> teacher, that kind of just blew my mind right there because you have to kind of be creative with, with the music. So well, you're right. And, and you know, actually, I did a poor job of modeling because, uh, you know, I that's not something as adults that we should say to our kids. We shouldn't say, well, I'm not this kind of this person or I'm not that because that's not true. Uh, we all as human beings are creative and we all have strengths and, and areas of growth. And um, so one of my areas of, uh, of of growth is in out of the box type of creativity, like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Give me a piece of music, I can play it, I can you know, interpret it, I can help others interpret it. Um, although it's been a long time since I've done that. So that might be, you know, please don't anybody take me up on that. Now I'm working with adults, you know, and helping them to improve their practice. Um, but like crafty type things, that's something that I have typically, I have not focused on improving my, my skills in. How's that? I love that. <laughs> now, um, we're going to take a brief commercial break, but okay. when we get back, I want to talk about how we can help teachers because I know teachers are going to need that yeah. time for a little bit of break and stuff as well. So sounds great. All right, guys, we'll be right back after this commercial break. Hi, you call me vlogging. I'm actually a blogger. My name is Melissa Vera. I blog Adventures of Frugal Mom. And actually, guys, I actually created a course that I teach in conjunction with Joy Worthy called Intro to Blogging. And it's really quick and simple and easy course to, to take. I take the guesswork out of blogging. Basically, what it is, is a very basic, groundbreaking, ground floor course about intro to blogging. It doesn't get you into the very technical levels about search engine optimizations, plugins, themes, anything like that. It's basically just the basic groundwork that you need to start a blog. A lot of times people get so caught up in doing the, trying to make the blog perfect without thinking about the quality of the blog. And they start thinking about things that they shouldn't be thinking about way ahead of the time than they should. I know when I first started blogging, I thought I was over my head and so I wanted to make it just as simple for someone to be able to do blogging very simply. Some of the things we discuss in our course is whether or not you should um, be self-hosted, if you should use WordPress or another hosting site. Um, we also talk about what type of quality or quantity of posts you should have before you publish, how to write an effective about me page how to um, land some sponsor posts, how to get actually paid. I actually teach another course called Intro to Blogging, which teaches how to get paid for blogging. Um, 
we we'll also talk about our contact forms, how people being able to contact you, as well as disclosure policies, and basically social media, and just a checklist of things that you need to do before you hit publish. Now, I teach these courses with Joy Worthy once a month. I teach intro to blogging once a month, and I teach um, how to make money blogging once a month, but I also do have private courses as well. All you need to do is contact me. Um, you can go to Adventures Frugal Mom at gmail.com and put in the in the subject line blogging course and I'll get back to you and I'll share you the spreadsheet and everything and, and we'll kind of work out a way. I do teach one-on-one -on -one classes. I do have a five-week course that you can get a Zoom call with me once a week to kind of go over and strategize what you're going through. It could be group coaching. It could be, it just depends on how many people have signed up. You could be individualized and in you never know. So I hope you are, if you're interested in blogging, I hope you will check this course out and guys i'm telling you when i first started blogging i wish there was someone like me that came along so i hope you're in, i hope you check it out let's get back to blogging and we are back now let's talk about how we can help our teachers with this slump because they're going to need a break they are not going to want to be engaged and i know a lot of teachers they this year has been very very hard for them very hard i have several really good friends one of my best friends is actually an elementary school teacher she teaches third grade so how can what can we do for teachers as parents to say hey you did a good job how can we show them appreciation yeah this has been uh, i've used the phrase a decade-long year um, it's been a really, really long, hard year. Um, retirements are up, resignations are up, and um, teachers and principals, superintendents are saying, you know what, I, I can't do this anymore because it's been really hard. And so uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is show grace and um, express your appreciation. There's nothing like getting a card in the mail or an email that says, hey, I know you've been working really hard and I wanna thank you for the work that you've done with you know, my child and for other children. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. Um, just as simple as that um, and as, as maybe trivial as that sounds, it really goes a long way and helps people feel valued and appreciated. Um, and, and emails are good, handwritten notes are even better. Um, and it doesn't have to be accompanied with, you know, anything tangible, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, a gift card. Gift cards are nice, you know, um, books that they might really like are nice. Um, if you don't have the means for that, don't worry about it. Just send them a nice note of appreciation and saying uh, just a, a genuine thank you goes a long way. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, find out what you can do to support them, not just uh, in your own child's learning, as important as that is, but in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to volunteer, um, that's a really wonderful, wonderful help um, that, you know, you have to go through processes. Your school district probably has processes around volunteers and clearances mm -hmm. and things like that. But if you take the time to go through that, um, you know, having a regular time to go in and, and read to a child who struggles with reading or help them with their math facts, who struggles with math, uh, or anything else, you know, the, just sitting and having conversation with a group of kids. These types of things can go a long way in really helping um, teachers and um, the system feel supported and um, alleviate some of that stress. For sure. And I will say that I'm a big advocate of volunteers and working one on one with the teacher. When my middle daughter, who actually just two weeks ago graduated college with her bachelor's of fine art in interior architecture, she congratulations. Um, when she was in first grade, we didn't think she was going to make it past first grade because she had all these struggles learning. She couldn't, she wasn't reading on level. This was like the middle of the school year. The teacher came to us and said, you know, this is the same teacher that my oldest daughter also had said, you know, we really think of need to think about holding her back mm -hmm. because she's not up to the level. And I'm afraid that the more she goes further, she's going to struggle. I said, okay, what can we do to help her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we got her a tutor outside. She also had a volunteer come in and work with her 
one-on-one, you know, when the volunteer would come in, she'd be one of the students that were being pulled out. We got her tested. She was tested for ADHD, which is amazing because her focus on detail for building and anything else is like her focus is ultra focused. So it's amazing wow. that she was focused and she was diagnosed with ADHD. But we got her put on a little, she was like a little bit of medicine, not a whole lot of medicine mm -hmm. to get her to function. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the school year, she was reading on level, if not above level. And she actually got um, diagnosed as learning disabled in math and not reading. And math was her strong point. So go uh -huh. figure that one out. But yeah. for an advocate of volunteers going in and helping the students, because yeah. I don't think yeah. if she didn't have that one-on-one -on -one time where she got pulled out, she didn't feel like she was the, the dummy in the class, yeah. then that helped her self-confidence yeah. and her self-esteem as well. It's huge, the one-on-one, -on -one, and especially if it can be regular. If it can be like a once-a-week type thing where you go in and spend 30 minutes reading to a student or helping them with their math or whatever, um, if it can be regular especially, because then you build that relationship. Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're social beings. And yes. so when the child is able to build a relationship with you, then there's more trust there. They're able to then further their learning based on um, that relationship. And let's talk about that brought up a subject of, of mine about parents building their relationships with their kids, especially if they have more than one kid making mm. sure they spend that one-on-one -on -one time with each kid, because I know mm. some parents don't have that time. So what can they do to kind of help them engage, still engage them in learning, but have it so that it's one-on-one -on -one time with their that one particular child? Yeah. Um, my experience is that it's not the quantity of time that matters so much as the quality of the time. So it doesn't matter, you know, if you've got, if you can, if you spend 18 hours every day with your child, but you're just sitting next to each other and not doing anything else, that's not as good as if you have a 10 minutes a day, but it's really good personal connections where you're having great conversations with each other, right? So this quantity of 20 hours mm -hmm. isn't as important as 10 minutes of quality. Now, if you can have more time than 10 minutes of quality, yeah. that's wonderful, that's even better. I, I think the focus has to be, though, on how can we make, because we're all busy, we're all mm -hmm. pulled a lot of different directions. The time that we have, are we really devoting it to making sure that, that our child knows that we care about them and that we're listening mm -hmm. to them and understanding them? Um, on, on the first podcast, we talked about those three skills of pausing, paraphrasing, and posing questions. Mm -hmm. So as the parent making sure that I'm not interrupting them. Like um, when, if the child is talking about something that they're excited about, let them talk. Uh, don't jump in with your own questions, let them talk. And if they get stuck, it's okay, wait, listen, just be silent and allow them to think of the words that they want to and to share with you what they're talking about. Um, and then, you know, paraphrase. So that's the pausing, then the paraphrasing. Oh, so it sounds like you were really excited about X, Y, and Z that happened today. And right, so I'm just paraphrasing back for them to help them know that I understand what they said. Or it sounds like you were really frustrated by X, Y, and Z. I'm not trying to solve your problem. I'm just, you know, letting you know that I understand. That's building a relationship. And, and in this order, right? Pausing first, mm -hmm. then paraphrasing, then, then you can pose a question if it's appropriate, right? Uh, so, so tell me, what were some of the things that led you to being frustrated or that contributed to the frustration? Or what were you thinking about you might do to alleviate that frustration, right? There were a zillion questions you could ask. But again, this idea of making sure that the interaction is positive, that it's quality time, and that I'm not jumping in with my own ideas or to solve their problems, but instead to, to build those bonds of relationship with, with your child. Now, let's say, how did you do your quality time with each one of your boys? How did you do that when they were younger? It's something that I, I wish I had done a better job of, um, quite frankly, um, because uh, I was, when they, were, when they were younger, I was working on my master's degree, mm -hmm. and then I was working on my doctoral degree, and then I was a principal, and then I was a central office administrator, and uh, I, I wish I had done a better job of that. When I became aware 
of <laughs> my lack of attention to them, what what we made sure is that at dinner time, that that was the time that was our family time where we really focused on each other. So, um, you know, if if they didn't get devices until later on, but when they did, they were put away. You know, we didn't have mm -hmm. our devices out at dinner. They they go away. Um, we sit down and we have a dinner. Like it was pretty sacrosanct uh, that pretty much every night we had dinner together. And sometimes it was later in the evening because, you know, of basketball practice or soccer practice or track or whatever. But it, this is our time together as a family. We sit down and we have a meal together um, and, and we talk about our day. Um, and one of the questions that that um, I advocate for parents to ask their child is, tell me about, just tell me about your day and uh, what were some of the highlights and what were some of the struggles? And you'll notice that those three questions that I asked, tell me about your day, what were some of the highlights mm -hmm. and what were some of the struggles, they're open-ended questions and they don't confine thinking. Too many times we ask our, our child, what was the best part of today? And what do they do? Oh, no. they say, I don't know, <laughs> or nothing, right? That's because we asked them a question that didn't, didn't help them think. And when we ask a person to come up with the best or the worst, the brain goes into a mode where it's, it's now got to prioritize and it's got to come up with the best or the worst. And that's a lot of pressure for the brain. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and so take away that pressure. So what were some of the highlights of the day? Now it opens up the possibilities. Now your child still might say nothing, especially if they're a middle schooler or you know, a teenager, um, but it, it provides the space for the brain biologically to be able to respond in a, in a safer way. So what were some of the highlights of today? What were some of the challenges of today? And you notice it's also plural, it's not just one. Um, and, and if they say uh, nothing, then you can say, well, if, if there was something, what would it be? Yeah. Um, you know, don't let it go. Don't just drop it. Uh, and don't get into a fight or a power struggle. It can be just a very, you know, a, a nice little conversation. And it can sometimes be helpful for the adults to start off um, and express, you know, that vulnerability. You know, one of my biggest challenges today was um, I had a really tough meeting with my superior or with my secretary or with a colleague and we don't see eye to eye and I just really struggled with you know having that vulnerability allows your child because as you said earlier your, your kids sometimes uh, they put us up on a pedestal yeah. and so doing things intentionally to help them understand that we're people too um, helps to build that relationship of course I knew as soon as you quit talking, I was going to call. <laughs> that's what I'm stuck in my throat. Um, so what happens when you ask those questions and the kids look at you and go, nothing? Yeah, yeah. And that happens. So um, you could, uh, uh, several different responses. One is, okay, well, if there was something, what would it be? Um, <laughs> well, nothing. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I can I can wait. I've got patience. Give me you know, take a little bit of time. Now, when you do that, uh, it's important for your body language to not be threatening. Mm -hmm. So there's a few things that are pretty subtle that still communicate threat, even without intending it. So for one, eye contact um, can be perceived as threat by the brain. So when you ask the question. Don't say to your, your child, I'm going to look directly into the camera. I've been looking down at you this whole time. But I'm going to look directly in the camera. Don't say to your child, well, if there was something, what would it be? <laughs> that would be creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yet that's many times the type of thing that we do without realizing it. So instead, look away. So if there was something that you might highlight for today, what, what might it be? Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's much less threatening. I'm looking away. I'm moving my head. My intonation, my voice was going up and down. It ended with, with an up. 
Um, so, so these ways to be able to open the conversation um, can be really helpful. It still may not work, but give it a try and keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So is there anything else that you want to leave us with? Anything else that I'd like to leave you with? Um, I would say that, um, you know, parents are the first teacher of your ch child. And so any way that you can reach out to the school to partner with them in your child's education is really important. And um, not just partner, but also advocate for your child's needs in a friendly and a kind and a supportive way. Um, but schools, schools are, and parents have the same goal, and that is your child's success. And so let's work together to find the ways to make sure that we're working together to, to meet that goal. And Chad, tell people where they can find you at. Yeah, the easiest way probably is on my Twitter page, which is at Chad Dumas, C-H-A-D-D-U-M-A-S. Uh, and if you don't have Twitter, that's okay. You can just go to Twitter and put that in and it'll it, that, that will then show you my link to my website, my Facebook, uh, my email. Uh, my, my website is uh, nextlearningsolutions.com, nextlearningsolutions.com. But if you just go to the Twitter handle at Chad Dumas, that'll get you everything that you need. Yeah. And Chad, I want to thank you for coming back on again and chatting about education. You can definitely tell that you have a passion for it and letting us pick your brain and about how we can keep our kids engaged this summer. It's my pleasure. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. Guys, we will see you on the next chat from the blog cabin. Bye.